Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Yeah, I'm Ben Wilson. I'm an alcoholic. I'm English by birth, Scotch by absorption, <laughs> Irish biology, and American by adoption. Um, I didn't get here by accident. I didn't get here because I had one too many hangovers. I got here by some divine means that uh, has allowed me to stay here for quite a time now. Um, I've been sober since December the 12th, 1970, and uh, that's a long time for a drinker of my type. Uh, and I say it early in the meeting because uh, I want to let you know that there is some definitive truth in this pitch, and it's the one thing that hasn't changed, and uh, since that time I haven't had a drink of any sort, I haven't stuck anything in my arm or in my ear or up my nose or up my ass that would have changed my mind. I haven't smoked any social non-habit forming marijuana. And uh, I have not compensated for a Valium deficiency. I got a coke each year for not taking nothing. None of the other things which I'm told will help my sobriety by don't doing them do I manage to do on an all-time basis. I don't know what the tribal customs are around here, but I'm sure a lot of people are telling you to don't do things. And uh, <laughs> we of Alcoholics Anonymous as represented by the big book don't even tell you to don't drink. It's got a lot of musts in that book. It's got four don'ts surprising don'ts. Uh, might get into those a little bit later, but there are 67 musts. And normally around the meetings, we hear it in inverse ratio to that. There are lots of don'ts and very few musts. Um, I'm not here to criticize, I'm here to report. It, it, <laughs> it's amazing how most of what we say at the meetings is the opposite of what it says in the book. And yet we grow a pace, you know. I, I don't know how many. I haven't counted them actually, but they told me there's something like a million and a half, and a half people here. Um, sober and Alcoholics Anonymous. The most I've ever counted by a sweeping gesture of my hand was 55,000 in the Olympic Stadium in Montreal last July. That was a big crowd. Big Friday night meeting there. Um, I got here at my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous sometime in the latter part of December 1970. And I'd like to tell you the guy who came to Alcoholics Anonymous who he was so that you can see that there's a change. And I'd probably better, at some stage in the evening, tell you a little bit about drinking, because otherwise I might sound like the visiting lecturer from overseas. And, <laughs> and I'd, I'd hate you to think that I was that. I'd, I'd also hate you to think that I'd become well through the power of positive thinking. I sat here for about ten minutes during the break and the collection, wondering whether to go to the bathroom or not. Right at the end... <laughs> Just before we were getting ready to resume after taking the money, I decided to go to the bathroom. Um, I, I, I read a lot of those self-help books. I joined Alcoholics Anonymous like most of you. I stole a big book, was given a 12 by 12, bought some of the paperback editions, I read them all, did absolutely nothing about what they said, and went on to self-help books. There may be some of you who progressed as far as think and grow rich. I did. What was that one about why nice guys finish last, or why SOBs succeed? I mean, that's just about getting to me. And of course, none of them work for selfish, self-centered people of my type. Um, the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous works extremely well 
when the instructions are followed. It is not a primer on reading. The words in it are, are absolutely perfect. Uh, for those of you who've discovered what the word semantic means and are using it against old-timers who stick their fingers in your face and say, read the goddamn black words. And you say, oh, well, it's just an exercise in semantics. What's the difference between, you know, this word and that word? I'll tell you how precise it is. It says in there that we don't like to pronounce anyone alcoholic. Now, it doesn't say we don't do it. It just says we don't enjoy doing it. <laughs> you see, now that's how precise the big book is. <laughs> For those of you who have sponsors who haven't read it, <laughs> I will tell you it says that we do not wish to be the arbiter of anyone's sex life. Now, that's bad news if you've got a sponsor who hasn't read the big book. Um, in there, it doesn't tell you how to get a sponsor either. That's bad news. It tells you how to be one. It's very, very back to front. It's strange, because what we have to do to get and stay sober, to maintain our sobriety, is to unlearn everything we've ever learned. And, uh, and that's very difficult. Booze helped me unlearn some things. But when I got here, I still thought that if I got up earlier in the morning, worked harder, and with the aid of Alcoholics Anonymous, I would, I would be able to be a success. You know, what is it? The early worm that catches the bird, and the hostess with the mostess, and when the going gets tough, the tough get going. I mean, I knew about that one, because that's how I worked it all my life. I... I knew that when it got really bad, I, I went to a military academy which did not believe in surrender. <laughs> it, we didn't even have white handkerchiefs. You know, when the ammunition ran out, it was bayonets, and then bite their fucking ears off. <laughs> and, and that's not good training for Alcoholics Anonymous. So there are quite a lot of us who were educated at that particular academy who got here. It's amazing. But we've had to unlearn this thing. I can take my jacket off. <laughs> Art's doing great for me tonight. He's organizing the coffee. I have a sponsor who tells me to wear a suit and a tie when I speak out of town. And... Luckily, of course, he, he, he didn't go any further and tell me I had to keep it on all the time. <laughs> so complying with those conditions. I was standing by the window of a lunatic asylum watching you show up for the first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous that I was ever able to attend. I was in the same building as the meeting. I knew about it. And I was free to cross the entrance hall and walk into that meeting. This does not mean I went to it. But it was the first one I was ever able to attend. And I watched you arriving. And you were a very, very sorry sight. <laughs> Old automobiles that really should have no place on the road at all. Some people came by bicycle, which is a pathetic means of transport to come to a meeting. Some others came by bus, and some, more humiliating than anything else, walked. And I stood there for my hilltop of contempt, and I said, I will not join these people. If that's all they get out of their sobriety, it is not worth doing. And I went and played Scrabble. Now, I did not have a driver's license, to enable me to drive one of these pathetic automobiles. I had no money. I was not allowed even to go to the front gate to walk back. And yet I was looking down on you. That's some sort of soul sickness, isn't it? It's pretty sad. And I was blaming you for how I felt as a member of a lunatic asylum. Now, I hadn't even got there by accident. I, 
I was not framed on my way to Alcoholics Anonymous, I tell you. <laughs> I had 135 offences, and I was a newcomer to crime. <laughs> well, I tell a slight lie and inaccuracy. I was a newcomer to being caught a crime. I was a first offender at the age of 37, standing there before a judge who told me what was going to happen to me if I ever came in front of him again. He didn't stutter once and told me I'd get a long time in prison if I ever came back in front of him. And that threat and the fear of what had been happening to me kept me sober for several months. I went to the second meeting that uh, happened in that treatment center, lunatic asylum, call it what you like. I, I got there again by accident, and, and if there's one thing you'll probably hear in my pitch, it's that choice is an illusion. Uh, I, I feel sorry for people who are still choosing, but they don't know that they're choosing to choose, or not being able to choose to choose to choose, because, <laughs> because it's all gone, um, is my opinion. I will just have a little opinion here. That's my opinion, is that the choice has been taken away long before I got to Alcoholics Anonymous. And the following Thursday after I'd looked down on you guys, I, I got a bad letter. Uh, my wife of the time mailed all the bills to me. And that's very upsetting when you have no money. And uh, I was resentful. And, and I went and found one of the staff. I... I'm a tough guy, you know, but uh, these four or five pieces of paper threatened my happiness, and so I went to complain about her. And uh, I talked to this nurse, and uh, I'm ever grateful to the non-alcoholics and the treatment of alcoholism. Uh, I'm glad it wasn't one of you who might have 12-stepped me to death. He looked at me from six foot four tall, disdain and cynicism, and he said, I am too busy to deal with you. I'm going home in five minutes. Now, he didn't have any altruistic motive of going off to an a and meeting. He was just going home. They ceased to pay him five minutes from this moment, and he wasn't going to waste one more second on me than he was paid for. He read the letter, and he said to me, Go to the AA meeting tonight and talk to me about this in the morning. I have never talked to him about it, but I went to the AA meeting. He's the same man who earlier that day had said to me that when you come out of prison next time, you will have to live on a bomb site because nobody will bother to get you into a treatment center. And I said, you don't know who you're talking to. Of course, I kept that under my breath because I knew about nothing not being hostile to people in the treatment of alcoholism. You mutter this stuff under your breath and they don't hear you. <laughs> Last time I was in that part of the world, I stayed with he and his wife. They're good friends of mine today. I went to that AA meeting, and I've been going ever since. I discovered what was happening there. Now, I didn't discover it the first day. I, so several years later, I woke up at an AA meeting and discovered what was happening. And uh, I'll tell you what I think is happening here. It's like a treasure trail. And we've come into a checkpoint and we're picking up a clue tonight that will get us to our next meeting without taking a drink. And that's what I'm still doing. I'm checking in and somebody will give me a clue and I'll get to the next meeting without taking a drink. I don't know what it is. It may be a smile, it may be a wink, it may be some profound statement from some insincere newcomer. <laughs> I heard one the other day that I'll share with you. I, I would like to attribute this one to the Sage of Laguna, but it came from a guy who was sober about three weeks. And he said, if you want to feel better, quit complaining. God. <laughs> Thank God I don't remember who it was. Because <laughs> otherwise I'd have to give him credit for it. 
So we pick up clues and we get to other meetings and uh, if anybody's very new and is tempted to take notes, please don't. Because there's absolutely no logic to this pitch. You probably found that out by now. <laughs> we're, we're just wandering around sobriety and drunkenness and, and hopefully we'll end on a sober note. It's, uh, this is sharing. This is not lecturing. Or, there's nothing sequential about my story because it is not stored sequentially. And for those of <laughs> For those of you who are trying to take mental four steps, <laughs> try lifting two things sequentially in your brain. Can't do it. Even eggs and bacon become one thing if you think of them together. It's impossible to lift things in your head. And if you're tempted to take it by some other method than the format in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, I wonder why they didn't put Hazelden in the label. I'll tell you why, because it doesn't work. I'll tell you 20 better ways of taking the fourth step than the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. The trouble is none of them work. There are a hundred better ways of staying sober than this program. The trouble is none of them work. Now, I was always trying to find a better way till I got here. And they suggested just do the one that works. Try not to get the pride of authorship involved in the program of recovery they suggested to me. Well, after that first meeting, I walked out into the dining room of the Lunatic Asylum and I became the co-founder of a rival organization called the Royal Alcoholics Club. <laughs> I have pride of authorship. It lasted about ten minutes, thank God. I, I pass on a lot of the I don't know, the sayings, the things that have worked when I've heard them. The old timers who have cared more for my life than they have for my opinion of them. One of the best definitions I've ever heard of love I just gave you. And I care more for your life than I do for your opinion of me. Now that's, I've, I've got, I've got a little bit well of them when I arrived. I am able to do that tonight. I try and tell you the truth, not what you want to hear. And uh, one of those things that was passed on to me and I pass on to people I sponsor or other ships that pass in the night. If you're, if you're always working, why are we having this conversation? I love that. <laughs> you know, the conversation, of course, is yah, but yah, but yah, but. <laughs> if only, if only, if only. I had a guy I used to run that trip on, and uh, I would tell him the sincere problems that I had in life, and he'd say, what do you want? And I'd say, you addle-brained old-timer, you didn't listen. And I'd tell him again what the problem was, and he'd say, what do you want? Four years later, I was sitting in an AA meeting and I heard what he said. He said, what do you want? <laughs> what do you want? I mean, and that's what I say to the guys I sponsor. What do you want? And they're saying, she did, he did, they did, we did. He won't, she won't, I can't. And I'm saying, what do you want? Very difficult to be satisfied by the solution if you don't know what you want. I have a sponsor, I have several sponsors. All of them have been geographically solo. That's the best way of putting it. I have not changed sponsors except by theirs or my geographical moves. I have not fired one of them. It's one of the few things I haven't done sober i goddamn near everything else. But uh, they've moved, some of them, and I've moved. And uh, 
one of them, and I'll talk about them because they're guys who've been very important to me. A man called Bobby Phillips. Some of you may know. He lives in Roswell, New Mexico now. He said one night at a meeting, if you don't want what you got, you can't get what you want. And cold shivers went down my spine because I didn't want anything that I got that day. I was here in America about six months, living with a woman I hated. <laughs> Not wanting to be there, an illegal immigrant, slightly insecure. <laughs> and I went up to him after the meeting, I said, is that true? And he said, yes. He said, and, and I said, well, I'm screwed then. You know, if that's true, that uh, if I don't want what I got, I can't get what I want. I, I never, it's never going to get any better. He said, well, there's just a chance for a guy like you. He said, you could be grateful for the shit you're in. <laughs> because he said, if we were to give you what you think you want, you would be a dissatisfied person with a new set of circumstances. <laughs> New woman, dissatisfied with her, etc., etc. You know the story. And uh, gradually, over the years, it has got to be that I want what I got most of the time. Except when it's seemingly bad, on its way to being perfect. And I know that life is divided into good and seemingly bad. And I'm a wonderful person and I can suffer all this bad luck silence, and with a cheerful smile. But I tell you, it sucks when it's seemingly bad, doesn't it? <laughs> and I just want to go kill somebody. <laughs> but it doesn't last as long as it used to. And, uh, the resentments are less highly tuned since I wrote them down in that format from the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. They're less highly tuned since I play, prayed for the people who caused my bad luck. My sex life has got a lot better since I wrote about it. I've, uh, I've been out to fetch a few people back to Alcoholics Anonymous. And I used to wonder how they got struck drunk. And I'm an inquiring sort of person, so I used to ask them. That is a mistake. You're asking somebody who became violently sick all of a sudden, why they became violently sick all of a sudden. <laughs> because they had a period of seeming wellness, we tend to listen to them. I read the book these days and it tells me why they went out and they came back. The people who do not recover are those who cannot or will not completely give themselves to a simple program. No other reason whatsoever. Now, if you're not completely giving yourself to this simple program, you may or may not know. <laughs> it's bad news if you don't know, but you're probably in the grace of God, and I certainly was when I didn't know whether I was completely giving myself. And uh, I sort of have a feeling today that I'm as completely as I can giving myself to this simple program. Now, on this question of asking them why they got drunk, when I gave up asking them and looked at the book, and then I asked them some specific questions. Because people had remarked about the fourth and fifth step, and I had held that over to one side and said, this will do for postgraduate work. When you have been around here a long time and got well, you will be well enough to do this thing that they tell you will allow you to get well. Something very sick about that. But I hear it being muttered occasionally. And so, I started to ask people whether they'd taken the fourth and fifth step. If they had been sober, you know, for some time and drunk again, because I didn't want to get struck drunk. And I was willing to do more or less what was necessary to not get struck drunk. More or less. If it didn't inconvenience me and didn't require too much courage, because I didn't have much courage. And... Uh, most of the people hadn't taken the fourth step. Then I got more specific as years went by and I found people who were coming back after many years of sobriety. I once went to 
12 step a guy who'd had 25 years of continuous sobriety and was six, six weeks drunk. And I asked him some questions. And I've asked people since. And most people, when questioned, say that, will admit that they haven't done the fourth step like it says in the big book. And none of the people I've carefully questioned have ever taken the sex inventory like it says in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. I am left with the impression that it's very important. I am also left with the impression that it seems to be very difficult unless you've got a sponsor who's done it. Very, very difficult. And as I mentioned earlier about uh, the big book telling you how to be a sponsor and not how to get one, I'll tell you how to get a sponsor if somebody hasn't appointed themselves already. And if somebody's appointed themselves, they're probably fairly well. Pushy, but fairly well. <laughs> now, I'm pushy. I just say to a newcomer, you know, you're too thick to make up your mind, so it's me. <laughs> Might just say he's his goddamn wife. Now, if nobody's appointed themselves and you're wondering how to get this person who will change your life. I have some questions that you would ask. Seek out a prospective sponsor and then ask him the following questions. The first one is, how long have you been sober? Now, it doesn't matter what the time is as long as that person answers with a period of time. If they say anything else at all, walk away. If they say, I haven't had a drink since one, because they're not going to take, tell you when they last took that non-habit forming whatever it is that they took sometime since their last drink. You need a definitive answer from that sponsor. The next thing you ask is, have you taken all 12 steps like it says in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous? And if they say yes, you then ask question number three, which is, will you help me take all 12 steps of the big book, like it says in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous? And if the answer to two was yes, the answer to three will be yes, because you found the right person. You have found a sponsor. It's, it's amazing. It works. And uh, then we'll be launched on this road of happy destiny. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> You know about suggestions and musts? I heard a guy talking to somebody who sponsored one day and he said, I'll explain about the difference between musts and suggestions. He said, as they leave my mouth, they're suggestions. As they hit your ears, they're musts. <laughs> Haven't told you about vomit yet, have I? <laughs> I did drink alcohol, i got to tell you that. And just before I get into telling you about drinking, I'll, I'll tell you about my other sobriety date, because it seems to be fashionable amongst the half measures variety of people to have two sobriety dates. One for NA and one for AA, or one for Overeaters Anonymous. I don't know, but people, you know, I last smoked dope on such and such a date, but I've been sober since. Well, I'll tell you, I haven't drunk rum as a result of a bad hangover and vomiting, I have not drunk rum since July the 1st, 1953. <laughs> and as a result of not drinking rum since July the 1st, 1953, absolutely nothing changed in my life. <laughs> and if you've got two sobriety dates, the same's true for you. <laughs> Because nothing changed when we swapped addictions. Sometimes we get to smell better, depending which one you're doing last. But this is a program for not doing nothing. And uh, there are people who say that uh, we don't talk about drugs in Alcoholics Anonymous. They're not a group who haven't read the big book. There's I, I was I was very privileged. I got to know a man whose stories in the big book a long time ago, and uh, 
he talks about three different drugs in one paragraph in his story. If you've ever got to meet a bald-headed old fart from Dublin, Ireland, called Sackville, the squarest man I ever knew, confirmed drug addict, talks about going to his first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, doped up to the eyebrows. So if you're new and hip slick and cool and think you invented it, back in 1946 that old fart was coming in as a newcomer who was also a drug addict. <laughs> I heard him when I was about a year sober and he was the speaker at a, an AA dinner. He was talking about love. And from my hilltop of contempt, I looked at him and I thought, God, a long time since you have a, I even had a good fantasy. <laughs> I mean, I did not understand. And about three years later, I was sitting there listening to him again, different place, same pitch, and he's talking about love. The love that asks nothing but the ability to give. And I could hear because I'd been doing some of it. And this is what we're here for. We're not here for ourselves, we're here for the next guy. And as a fringe benefit, we get to stay sober. Uh, the words of the preamble are precise. It talks about staying sober and helping other alcoholics to achieve sobriety, does not say then, or or, or later on, it says and. And and means simultaneously. In any interpretation of the English language I have ever heard. And yet, most of us are saying we'll do that later. Well, you'll get the results later. Tough shit. <laughs> I went on my first 12-step call before I had ever met any of you. I'd read the big book the day before. I'd read it from cover to cover. I'll tell you how I read it. I started with the stories, read to the back, and then started at the beginning. I wanted to see if any of you were of my type. Now, I had a problem with God, so every time I saw the word God, I skipped three lines, automatic reaction, like a word processor. God comes up, skip three lines. Well, most of the text it's very difficult to read. I mean, God's in there at least every three lines. <laughs> so I read it relatively quickly. There's a story on page 32 that saved my life. It talks about some idiot who at the age of 30 quit drinking because it was interfering with his life. I and mean, that's foolish. And he quit for 25 years whilst he became very successful in business. Sold out. What's it say? Out came the carpet slippers and a bottle of wine. Oh, what a wonderful reward for 25 years of abstinence. And then he's trying to stop and he can't. And three years later he's dead. And I made that profound statement, Ben, you must never ever drink again. Now, on the wall of my cell, there was a picture, a picture of the Rivoli Bar in the Ritz Hotel in London, and there was a bottle of champagne in the cooler in the background of this picture, and that picture stayed on the wall of my cell until I left. I wasn't totally sold on sobriety. Like, you know, some people are still carrying around the cause hat or the moose head t-shirt or whatever it is. I got no views on it. <laughs> it. The glamour, I believe, at some stage has to be taken out of alcohol. It's a difficult pitch. Can I drink seven up from your navel? Doesn't seem to have the ring of it, but <laughs> Tom Perignon had. Got a much better success ratio, I've got to tell you, but <laughs> doesn't have the win. <laughs> anyway, the next day I'm I'm on the exercise yard, walking round with a, another successful drunk, 
and I'm telling him that if he and I join Alcoholics Anonymous, we might never have to come back there again. I didn't enjoy pronouncing him alcoholic either, by the way. I just did it. He was a disbarred member of the Institute of Bankers. He'd walked into the big safe and gone out. <laughs> <laughs> There was this retired cavalry officer and this banker walking around the exercise yard of Oxford Prison together, having a social chat in the morning. <laughs> in our grey uniform and striped shirts. <laughs> <laughs> and I crossed at Ralph. And he went to Alcoholics Anonymous. And a year and a half later, I was outside the gate waiting for him when he came out. And I took him home took him to a meeting that night, took him to a meeting the next night. He got to one late or night after that, and I've only seen him once since. I don't know whether he's drunk or sober, but I know I'm sober as a result of sharing with a guy called Ralph. And uh, it is the 12th step of this program that has absolutely changed my life. The really wonderful experiences have come in the practice of the 12th step of our program but you can't give anything away unless you've done it. You know, you, it says we can only give away what we've got. And what did I give Ralph that morning? There was no knowledge. And incidentally, knowledge is the booby prize here. You will pursue it until you discover it doesn't work. And it has no value. The man in here who knows the most has nothing more than anybody else. Because knowledge counts for nothing in here. Experience counts for a hell of a lot. I gave to Ralph the one thing I had that morning, and that was hope. I gave him hope, and I practiced with that hope. Went to my first cocktail party when I was about 12 or 13, and I had two glasses within 10 minutes. I got to be sober about 10 years before I discovered it was okay to have two cups of coffee simultaneously. But nobody in the manufacture of AA podiums has made one that's flat to put your coffee on since Bob Phillips and I made the podium for the primary purpose group in Sacramento. And there's room for about six cups of coffee on that. But they burnt it and made a newer one. And I was up there talking the other night and it, they're back to sloping podiums. <laughs> they don't know nothing. I lied, cheated, stole, gossiped, and had lustful thoughts before I ever took a drink of alcohol. And I've lied, cheated, stolen, gossiped, and had lustful thoughts since December the 12th, 1970. <laughs> and during the intervening period of about 25 years, I lied, cheated, stole, gossiped, and had lustful thoughts. I was less careful during the drinking period. <laughs> But I point this out because it's important. When I was in group therapy in that lunatic asylum, I was blaming alcohol for the fact that I was a thief. Strange, I stole before I drank. And yet I'm blaming booze for being a thief. There's something wrong with the picture. Something very wrong with the picture. This is why hard-hearted old sponsors who you never have to get to like, will save your life. I have a line that I use frequently. It offends people. I tell them that if their mouth is open, they're either lying or exaggerating. Normally true. I came into Alcoholics Anonymous lying and exaggerating. And luckily, there were some old farts there who took the risk. They took the risk to tell me that I was full of shit. Most of them were relative poli relatively polite the way they did it, you know. They, they'd become more sophisticated than I have in the ability to cut me to size. But I, I, I got an old sponsor who I bumped into again in Oklahoma City a few years back when I moved there. I'd known him in London and uh, Paul's a He's a strange sort of dude. You know, I 
first time I saw him, he was a speaker at a meeting, and it was like this. It was in London, and, and there's this guy in cowboy boots and a plaid sports jacket. I mean, totally out of place in London. Totally out of place. And what he did was embarrassing. I mean, God, he's standing up there at the podium talking about Alcoholics Anonymous, and in the middle of his pitch, he said, Do you know, he said this afternoon, I hit a golf ball 350 yards, made love to five women, and was promoted president of my corporation. And I said, God. And he stopped for a whole minute, and then he went, Oh, right up here. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, This guy I got to listen to, you know. And I arrived in Oklahoma City a few years later. Eight, nine, ten years later, six thousand miles away, and he was coming the other way around the world, and we were in the same city together. And there's my ready-made sponsor, the man who just saved my life, one of the worst days in my sobriety. And I called him up, and I got through to him in his office, and uh, he said, "Sounds like you're having a great day." And I went. Don't give me that shit. I'm crying. You know, my life has fallen apart. I've gone to live with this rich lady. God. Don't like to admit that. Went to live with a rich lady in Oklahoma. Tell you why I went to Oklahoma shortly, but... Uh, <laughs> I didn't know at the time. I thought I'd gone to live with this rich lady. And uh, she was throwing me out. And I'm crying to Paul and... Uh, he said to me, have you had a drink today? And I said, no, of course I haven't. He said, sounds like a great day to me for an alcoholic of your type. <laughs> and I'm crying. And uh, then he listened. Then he listened. And maybe 20 or 30 minutes later, he said to me words that uh, typify him as a person who has never been to sponsorship school. He has never been trained in sensitivity programs. <laughs> Taught me that in his 22 years at that time of sobriety, he'd learned nothing. He said to me, this is not the sharing of experience. This is not advice. This is an instruction. Listen very, very carefully. He said, I want you to go to a meeting tonight. I want you to find somebody newer than you are who's having a worse day than you are, and I want you to work with them and call me in the morning, and I got a dial tone in my ear. <laughs> and he saved my life. He didn't care for what I thought of him. He calls me on my AA birthday, of course, from Arkansas or wherever it is that he happens to be at the time, I get a call on my AA birthday from this guy who has no sensitivity whatsoever. <laughs> Tell you why I went to Oklahoma. I went to go to group therapy. <laughs> Tell you why I went to group therapy. I tend to knock therapy. I tend to tell you a lie that I have stayed sober without the benefit of therapy for nearly 16 years. But I have to tell you about going to therapy in Oklahoma City. I didn't know why I went to therapy. I, well, I thought I was going to therapy to impress the rich lady I was living with. She was in therapy. <laughs> before, I kept, before I got back to California, they found her guilty on five fraud charges involving a quarter of a million dollars. But uh, I went to therapy this afternoon, this evening, and uh, in the elevator leaving, very dull it was, very dull, I, I started to talk to this guy. He was a sort of semi-successful attorney. Still got a license, you know how that goes. <laughs> and in the elevator on the way down, I discovered that he was four years sober in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, had not told his therapist, had not told anybody at the group that he was in Alcoholics Anonymous. He hadn't worked any of the steps. He needed to meet me, and we took a fourth and fifth step in the next two weeks. That's why I went to therapy. Not to get well, but to find that guy. You know, we get sent out on messages. My God moves me around 
and we were talking the car on the way down, and I said, you know, we never have to make a choice about it. We just get handed an airline ticket, or the car turns the wrong way, and we get to bump into somebody who needs to talk to us. And uh, I got to talk to a lot of people in Oklahoma, and then I came back to California. And uh, on the way back to California, I, I made a deal with God. Doesn't that sound awful? He made a deal with me a long time back, <laughs> I tell you. He said, Ben, you give me the credit, I'll give you the enjoyment. But don't screw with it. <laughs> Every time I take the credit, I lose the enjoyment. It's hell. It's hell. But I did this deal coming down the Rockies in the snowstorm. I went out there to Oklahoma, high hopes, and I came back in a 1973 Cadillac, which was uh, not going well coming down this side of the Rockies with the brakes binding, and I had about four or five hundred dollars in my pocket. It's amazing how you can be blase when it's only four or five hundred dollars and not know the difference. You know, but I'm that type of high roller. Uh, and I said, hey, Dad. What I'd like to do is I'd like to be self-supporting through my own contributions for the rest of my life. And I'm willing to jerk gas for the rest of my life if you will let me be self-supporting through my own contributions. Not jerk gas on the way to being the Vice President of Bechtel or the General Manager of the Western Hemisphere or, or some other job with potential. I'll just jerk gas if you'll let me pay the bills. And I cried. And it was one of those big deals that God and I had together. And it's been working ever since. He's been late with the payments occasionally. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I ever have trouble with work. Because it tells me now that I have a new employer. And he sends me out on subcontract to other human beings who recycle money to me on Fridays. And then I want to roll a little bit higher so I sell real estate, and then they recycle the money rarely <laughs> and unpredictably. But they recycle the money. So really I'm working for Dad in the family business, and so are you. <laughs> I never thought I could talk about God as our father. You know, this is not the man who came to Alcoholics Anonymous nearly 16 years ago. I leant against the roof of my car lunchtime a few weeks ago with a newcomer. I don't know, he's got 25 days, and I'd just given him a big book out of the trunk of the car. And we opened it at page 63, and we said the third step prayer out loud, leaning against the roof of my car in the mission in San Francisco in broad daylight. This is not the Ben Wilson who got sober 16 years ago. Things have changed in my life. This is not the guy who, who stole for a living. I've got to tell you about the drinking and the stealing sometime. <laughs> tell you a little bit about it, because it's important, you know. I used to say I was the last of the big drinkers. I used to get a little bit of a chuckle, and then I'd say I was the last of the big sponges, and they'd really laugh at that one, until <laughs> they went to the bank with the checks. And then they'd know it was the only truth I'd told them. This girlfriend of mine and I stole for a living for about four months. I was in the ideal circumstances, and I got back together with my wife and the, the three kids, and we bought a house on her father's money, and uh, my girlfriend lived the other side of town, and I used to drive backwards and forwards, and there were bars in between, and sometimes it was confusing. I'd get halfway there, and three quarters drunk, and come out of a parking lot and go the wrong way and I'd made an excuse to leave home to go and stay with her and there I am back again and I don't know what the excuse is that I left with you know but one morning she not the wife she came to me and she told me the police were looking for us and you know I mean I hate trouble <laughs> My definition of trouble at that time was being found out. It's strange how many years it's taken to discover that trouble means trouble. Just trouble means trouble. That's recovery. So I said, we'd better leave town. 
No, police are looking for us. Leave town. Makes absolute sense to me. About six months later, we discovered why. By this time, I'm in the penitentiary and the detective calls on me. And what had happened was that she'd lost her checkbook, some bar, some night, somewhere, and some woman had got busy with her checkbook. And he just wanted a statement, but we left town. <laughs> and we had embarked on four months of living by full-time crime. It was wonderful. I mean, really. I thought that crime allowed you to drink better, make more money on less effort. We used to have to get up very early to go and steal. You have to put a lot of preparation into it. You know how people say, take care? Well, it was taking care that got me to the penitentiary. I, I say, take a chance now. It's, it's much more productive. But we used to take care, I'd grow a moustache, change my clothes, I'd tend to walk differently, live in different places. I mean, we didn't live anywhere. We just stayed in five-star hotels or lived with gangsters or something. You know, we five nights in the same place was too long. But we would shop. I mean, we shopped for a living. She bought shoes. I mean, she did the shopping because I'm a coward and a manager. And if you're a coward and a manager and an alcoholic, you run it from the bar and she goes shopping. And that's how we did it. She went shopping and I told her what to buy next. I mean, there was one time she came back into the bar and she said, they've taken away my ID. I think the police are coming. I said, have a drink. We had a drink, and then we made our getaway. It was not Richard Burton in a stolen Jaguar going through the streets of London with the bells ringing and all that stuff. We lined up at the bus stop. <laughs> we caught a double-deck red London bus from the scene of the crime. It's humiliating. <laughs> this is not the story I told in the exercise yard of Oxford Prison when I was impressing the successful criminals. When I was talking to those guys who used to blow safes and do armed robberies, I, I didn't tell them that story at all. I didn't tell them about the time we were chased in our getaway car. We had this van and it was full of shoes. And, and we were chased. And we were nearly caught. And he was on foot and we were driving. I mean, the car just made it over the hill. During this time, we bought liquor. Now this, you know, I mean really bought liquor. Not just liquor, but liquor. We'd go shopping for it. We'd buy it by the case. And we used to pay full price for it. And then we'd sell it to the butcher for half price. And the butcher would sell it to the barman, bar owner. And we'd go into the bar and we'd pay four times the price for it in a glass. Now that is not good economics. <laughs> Except that we started with your check, so it was all right. This is how we lived the last four months of my drinking on the outside. I, I drank a little in prison, um, not significant quantity, but enough to be looking forward to it like it's the most important thing in the world. Took that last drink, a half a bottle of wine pushed the cork down the bottle with a plastic knife. They didn't have corkscrews where I was. And, I, I, and my legs felt bad, you know. I was, oh, I wasn't walking well around that cell, you know, 12 feet this way and six foot that way. The last drink I ever took. Didn't know it at the time. Didn't know. Some things happened that next couple of three weeks. A man came to discover whether I was an alcoholic or not. I thought he was going to, going to take tests. He knew he was going to take tests. He had this format there. And one of the things was it said, show previous employment. And gave three lines. Well, now, no self-respecting alcoholic can do anything with three lines for previous employment. <laughs> you know, it's the attached sheet. <laughs> but it, but he asked some really, um, you know, some awful questions about wetting the bed. Oh, heaven forbid homosexuality. 
And he looked sensitive, so I lied to him. I didn't want to tell him anything that would get me into trouble. Well, that's wind down time. Um, I just didn't want to tell the truth, but I wanted to be an alcoholic because I knew I didn't look like one. <laughs> and I wanted him to tell the court that I was an alcoholic. And I did something that was totally out of character. As he left, I said to him, Please, doctor, will you help me? And I blushed. It was so out of character, you know, I'd asked for help. Oh, God, had I asked for help. But I'd never said, just help me. I'd always said, lend me some money, lend me a car, lend me, give me, do for me, all those things. But never just help. And he said, I think I can. And uh, I told you about reading the big book. And the third thing that happened during that period was I was watching television one afternoon and there was the featured horse race was on television and a man I'd been great friends with at the military academy and he and I had planned how we were going to win the, the Grand National steeplechase many times over coffee and coffee shop at the military academy and there he was, uh, he just trained the winner of this featured race and uh, he was being interviewed and he's just smiling and looking good. And I wondered why it was. I'm sitting on this hard back chair in the prison chapel and Tim's there with, you know, X million people watching him. And I said, do you know it's more than a run of bad luck? It's more than a run of bad luck that makes us that different. We've been together and here we are, we're doing things slightly differently today. More than a run of bad luck. And it was two years later that he did train the winner of the Grand National, and I had one of the last bets I ever had, and it was that money that allowed me to start to make some financial ninth-step amends. And I'd, I'd misread Step 9 for a long while, and some of you misread it, because I hear you when you're reading it out, and uh, people say, whenever possible. And... Uh, it doesn't work whenever possible. It works extremely well wherever possible. And I thought that it was going to have to be whenever I got fifty thousand pounds, I could pay off all these people. And I'd like, I'd like to get an attorney to do it for me. I was going to write him one check and give him a list and and <laughs> just get him to do the work, you know. Well, I got to tell you, for an alcoholic of my type, it didn't work that way. And that same sponsor, Paul told me one day, not very long ago, I had two bad debts. I'd uh, done my most recent stealing. If you knew, it's bad news. I must have been, I don't know, 12 years sober. I misdirected some funds of a partnership my way. Didn't do it intentionally, but I did it. And I couldn't do anything about it when I'd done it. it took me some days, some weeks, to talk to my partner about it. And I told him, and I said, I'll pay you. He said, okay. He trusted me enough to put the land in my name. You know, I mean, it's bad when you do that, isn't it? And I was unable to pay for a time, and I went to see Paul. And he said, about these two debts, the other was to my ex-wife. He said, have you got two dollars? And I said, of course I got two dollars. He said, the trouble is, you're too arrogant to send them a dollar each, aren't you? Have you got $20? And I said, yeah. He said, well, send them $10 each. And these were for relatively large sums of money. I said, but I can't do that, Paul. He said, this is what you say in the letter. As you enclose $10, you say this is a very small percentage of the amount owed, but it is a very large percentage of the available funds. <laughs> and you do it wherever possible. <laughs> that old thought saves my life occasionally, yeah. I have wanted to drink since I got sober. I have chosen to drink since I got sober. I abandoned the choice the first time I took the third step. I believe that you abandon the choice when you take the third step too. But some of us are unwilling to give up that choice. We love the illusion of it. 
How often do you hear at meetings people saying, and I choose not to drink today? Well, that's great. You know, I mean, it's wonderful. What's, what are the odds against an alcoholic choosing not to drink consistently for 24 hours? They're pretty long. Pretty long. I mean, for it to happen for 24 hours consecutively for seven days, that's pretty long odds. And to go on for, I don't know, 5,700 days is beyond the realms of chance. And yet that first time I said the third step to the closet, I was, I was not wonderfully spiritual right away when I got sober. And I said, hey you, I know you're not there, I know that this won't work, but just as an experiment, please do the not drinking for me tomorrow. And it's worked ever since. But I believe I abandoned two things. I abandoned the choice as to whether to drink or not, and I abandoned anything but unconditional sobriety. I abandoned the option to not go on a 12-step call. I abandoned that option. And it's very important that I did that because I can't choose whether to go on a 12-step call or not. I watched some of you choose, and you don't make a very good show of it. Because I do teleservice, I know. And I call up and I say, there's a drunk at the corner of so-and-so needs to go to a meeting. And over half of you say, I'm sorry. Now, I've been doing this a long time, and this is about right. That it's a little over 50% of the people who answer the telephone, they're on the list to go out on 12-step calls who don't do it. Give me three consecutively who won't go. And I go, fuck you to the last one and call one of the guys I sponsor who I know will go. Because that drunk needs to get to a meeting. And I abandoned the choice as to whether to go or not. Because if I am going to choose between a business appointment and going on a 12-step call, my fear of financial insecurity has got to win. But I don't choose, and I haven't done since that time, so I've been on a lot of 12-step calls. That has been fantastic. It has changed my life. It's about time to wind down, because the clock went off. And I'll tell you about the last time I chose not to stay sober. Two years ago, I'm driving through West Texas on my way to Bobby Phillips' house because I've been crying for about five days and I don't know what's wrong and i got to go visit that man. And I'm driving through a nameless town in West Texas and the last building on the right-hand side is a bar and I slow down. Now, I have not made a positive choice to take a drink. I've not chosen not to take a drink. But I'm slowing down and I wonder what's happening. And I get opposite this building and I look to the right. I look to the right, and it's got a real estate sign right across the door, and it says for lease, and it's closed down. And one more time, this loving God, this loving Father of mine, has allowed me to slow down at a bar that isn't in business. And I went, fuck you, <laughs> and clogged it all the way to Roswell, New Mexico. And... Uh, all the answers came out when I got there, and it was wonderful, a wonderful experience. And uh, I want to tell you about the lady I did all that stealing with. I saw her today. She's about two weeks short of her 11th AA birthday. <laughs> that teeny bot, screwed up alcoholic who had three first birthdays in Alcoholics Anonymous has become one of those respected elder statesmen. Alcoholics Anonymous now, and uh, I'll close telling you about a guy I got to know real well. 1975, New Year's Eve, I think it was, or the day before. I was at a meeting, and a guy who's been in Alcoholics Anonymous for eight years, for the first time at a meeting, talked about his taking drugs. And I talked to him after the meeting, and I said, something and he said maybe you could help me and the next morning he was over at my house at 10 o'clock in the morning and uh, he took a fourth and fifth step with me that took three days consecutively 
most of the day and most of the night, and he brought his drugs, a big cardboard box full. You see, he was three years sober, hadn't taken any of the steps, couldn't sleep, went to a friendly physician. Now, this was physician-prescribed Valium that he started taking, because he couldn't sleep, because he didn't take the steps. And uh, that didn't work after a bit, he got another physician, and so on. And you know the story, and this great bulk of drugs that he would take on a bout basis, get hospitalized, and he was in really bad state because he hadn't been staying sober, hadn't been telling anybody, couldn't talk about it. And the third day, I got to know him in three days better than anybody I know. And when I listen to a fifth step, I take one because that's the way it works. And on the last day of that, he had kept some aspirin, that was all. And he took a bottle of aspirin because he couldn't believe that it was going to work. And he was hospitalized one more time, and I couldn't go and see him. I was just mentally incapable of visiting the guy. And a couple of days later, I went to see him, and, and he was a different man from the guy who'd been sitting on my sofa crying and sharing his most intimate details, oh, his history, his life. And I didn't see him ever again. March of that year, we got a phone call, and Tom Abraham had started to drink on the Thursday. And they found him dead on the Saturday. And I said, I hope that Tom Abraham didn't die in vain. And I don't think he did because I tell the story a lot. You see, Tom Abraham died because he couldn't sleep, because he didn't take the steps, and he met a friendly physician who solved the problem chemically. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.